Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. So today's lesson is Seeing the Invisible, and teaching today is Mark and Elisa, and we're really looking forward to this lesson. Um, but before we begin, Mark, who's the most important person to invite? Uh, the Lord. Yes. Exactly. Uh, if you could open us in prayer. Yep. And let's bow our heads. Uh, dear Jesus, thank you for allowing this time that we can come together, and we ask that you be with us and among us as we dig into your word and we learn to rely on you, and we learn to trust in you, and we learn and help us to gather these things that we learn in this Sabbath school to help ourselves, but our, our neighbors and our community to get to know you even more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. So seeing the invisible, I'm gonna re start off reading the, the verse memory verse for today, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. And obviously this is talking about Moses. Now last week's lesson focused on, on the hope that we have when we walk with Jesus, especially when we're in the midst of a crucible. This week's focus will be on faith, the second of three theological virtues. And 1 Corinthians 13.13 13 says, But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. But what is faith? We use the word all the time in church, right? But what is it really? The religious definition from, of faith from Merriam-Webster is, Belief and trust and loyalty to God. And the second definition is firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Well, I'm not sure that we have no proof, but um, it's not like we're jumping off the dark into a cliff. But the memory verse says, it's seeing him who is unseen, embracing what we cannot fully comprehend, knowing what we physically cannot see with our eyes, but we know with our hearts is there, and we see in other ways. Okay, so let's hear more of what God says about faith. Hebrews 11, we'll start with verse 1, and we're going to read verse 6 as well. And we're, verse 1 is in the lesson as well. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, verse 6, though, and without faith, it is impossible to please him, that's God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now, I looked this up in the SDA Bible commentary, and I love the definition they have. <clears throat> it says, without faith. So in other words, um, where it has, and without faith in the very beginning of verse six, without faith is, whereas the creator is infinite, his creatures are irrevocably finite, and there are accordingly things which they must take by faith. Indeed, to take God at his word is the most exalted exercise of which the human mind is capable. Indeed, he must take God at his word if he is to fill perfectly the place designed for him in a perfect universe. And I love this part. For a realization of the love of God culminates in faith. That is powerful. For a realization of the love of God that he has for us culminates in faith, our faith. And the divine human person of the Savior, God-like love and human faith met together for the first time. That would be in Christ Jesus. And then the impossible to please him from verse 6 as well. That is impossible to measure up to his requirements. He is God after all. There is no room in a perfect universe for a created being who lacks faith in the ruler of the universe. The only alternative to faith in God is fear and resentment and ultimately despair. Wow. Did Jesus see faith when he was in the world here? Yes and no. For, 
I have to say, we know that God has agape love for us, right? And we see the realization of that love that God has for us in people's faith. But let's actually read a few examples here. Because God, how much does he love us? We can't really put a finger on it, right? But scripture tells us in Luke 12, 7, Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. We're so valuable that God came down and sacrificed himself that we might live. How could you not love someone like that? And I know not everybody knows about him, but even when we think about it, we don't always register just what God has done for us. That we would love him and trust him with all of our heart and mind and strength. Did Jesus see faith in this world? I'm going to say here, yes, because... Luke 7, 6 through 7. Uh, now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, and this was when his servant was ill that he liked, and the, even the members of the synagogue asked Jesus to heal this man's servant. But his friends saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. And just the, the power of that testimony of the faith from a centurion, a non-Jew. In verse 9, Jesus says that I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. That is just one example of faith in the Bible. There are many others. I think of the Phoenician woman when Jesus says it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, and yet she did not give up. Her faith was concrete. Now we look at unbelief. We're going to look at one major example of unbelief. We look at Matthew 17, 17. This is a child that's possessed by a demon. And this is after they're coming back from the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? And how long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And in Mark, same story, different bo um, book, Mark 9, 23 and 24, this is the boy's father. And Jesus said to him, if you can, because the man asked if he could heal him, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. The boy's father at least is in the right direction. And we can see how we can learn from him who was unseen. There's two major points to come out in today's lesson. The first is that Faith is shaped by the words of God. Psalms 119, one, or 119 verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word is our guide, really our GPS guidance in life and all that we do. One must always remember that there is power in the name of Jesus, first and foremost, in God's word. What is stronger than God's promises in your life? We're going to look at that in today's lesson. And we want to read them in his word that we will see how faithful and true that God is to fulfill these things, even if it appears that God cannot be found. And the second is faith is empowered by the Spirit of God through prayer. Matthew 17, 17 through 21 and this is that same story about the boy that was possessed. And later his disciples asked him, actually I'm going to skip 17. Actually I'll read it. And Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? And how long will I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him. The demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Then his disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, 
You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not come, go out except by prayer and fasting. Prayer is your lifeline to God in every situation. One can experience how that connection strengthens the influence of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God in our lives. Let us remember this. Just knowing the scriptures is not really knowing him, let alone to have faith in him. We see this, that intellectual knowledge is not faith. And that when the Red Sea parted, was it because they had an intellectual knowledge or was it because they stepped forward in faith and the sea parted? Forty years later, when the River Jordan stopped flowing, when they carried the ark, their feet got a little wet and then they stepped into the deeper part and it was blocked. Faith is not just belief, it's an action. It's godly knowledge guided in action. Mark, can you tell us about Sunday, our Father's extravagance? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Byron. Thank you. So, um, you know, I wanted to kind of start out this and, and, and ask a question. Have you ever wondered if God loved you? Have you ever doubted that you were not good enough for him? Or something bad has happened to you and you doubt that the Lord was listening or even cares. I think we've all been there. And you're not alone. Actually, there are examples in the Bible, all throughout the Bible, that show this. And I wanted to, to start out. I wanted to, to I was, uh, during the study, I was reading Psalms, and I wanted to dig into one of the Psalms, Psalms 44. And I wanted to read this to us. Um, this is a, not, a, not an easy Psalm to read, um, but talks about this idea of doubt. And while I'm reading it, I'd like you guys to think of how it applies times in your life when maybe you doubted the Lord, when you thought you weren't good enough. So I'm going to read this through. It's Psalms 44. We're going to read the whole thing. Um, it starts out really well. It starts out really good. You, we have heard our ears, O oh God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in the days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out. For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did they own their arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you favored them. You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your, your name will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies. And you have put to shame those who hated us. In God, we boast all day long and praise your name forever. Shelah. Isn't this our story too? God, Jesus died on the cross. And we can, we can rely on that, that, that truth of him saving us in our sins. This is a story of a, a, a king of, of Judea that was thinking about these great things that God did for the children of Israel. But this is the, the, the pressing part. This is the point where it turns around, where he starts to doubt. We're going to read in verse 9. But you cast us off and put us to shame. And you did not go out with our armies. You make us turn back from our enemy and those who hate us who have taken spoil for themselves. You have given us up like sheep intended for food. You have scattered us among the nations. You sell your people for next to nothing and are not enriching by them. You make us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to those all around us. You make us a byword among the nations, a shaking of the head among the peoples. My dishonor is continually before me, and the shame of my face has covered me because of the voice of him who reproaches and reveals, because of the enemy, the avenger. He is depressed. He thinks God has left him. In fact, he's, he's blaming, could God really do this? In fact, he goes on and says this, All this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, Lord. I'm adding the Lord in there. Nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Your heart has not turned back, nor are our steps departed from your way. But you have severely broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. 
If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched our hands to the foreign God, would, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of our heart. Yet for your sake, we have killed all day long. We were accounted for sheep for the slaughter. Awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget your affliction or our oppression? For our soul is bowed down in their dust. Our body clings to our ground. Arise for our help and redeem us with your mercy's sake. Have you ever been in this place? This place that is shown and described in Psalms 44. It's a tough place. This is a person that feels like he's done everything right, yet the something as bad has happened to him. That's kind of a backdrop of what Paul, and we're going to dig into this part of the lesson, what Paul wants us to, helps us with, okay? And he helps us with, and we're going to start digging into Romans 8 and verse 28, chapter 8, verse 28. He, that, he, he talks about this same, says, and says simply, although it's tough to believe in these places, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. I don't know about you, but if I'm in this deep, deep, tough, tough place, this one phrase may not, uh, may not touch me. <laughs> it may not touch me. <laughs> right. It's ugly, but he's saying, no, this is, this is good, you know, to those who love God. Let's keep on. Let's read on. And in Romans 8, 28 and 29, he says, for whoever he forced, and he's talking about how we're saved by Jesus in these phrases. It's a little bit, this is a difficult couple of verses, but he talks about how we are saved by Jesus. And he says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the first born among brethren. He's talking about Jesus, and he's talking about how we are called to follow Jesus. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called, and whoever he called, he also justified, and whom, whom he justified, he also glorified. He's talking about us following Jesus, and as we follow Jesus, we will be glorified. And in third, Romans 31 and 32, still that doesn't touch my heart. Here, um, Paul turns it around and really appeals to our logic. And, and, and these are amazing verses um, in Romans 8, verses 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him us up for all of us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He sacrificed his only son. In fact, the most incredible sacrifice at all. So he's, Paul is appealing to our logic to say, how could he, he would not forget, he would not leave his love from us. And he keeps going on in Romans 35 and 36. He says, who shall se he addresses the trouble we may face. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? It is written, written for your sake, we were killed all day long and we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. In fact, if that last, that last sentence comes from Psalms 44 that we read right at the beginning. And Paul answers the question here in Romans 37, 38, and 39. He gives the answer to that Judean king that wrote Psalms 44. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul was using logic here in helping us to trust in the Lord, even in those times when it is, looks bad. But let's also read another area, another per place in the Bible where others were also doubtful of God's love. And we're going to go to Mark, and this will be pretty quick. We're going to go to Mark for chapter 4, 35 and 38. And this is Jesus and the disciples. 
And on the same day, when they had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. And when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And the other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose and the waves beat onto the boat and it was already filling. But he was but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Isn't this the disciples saying the same thing that was said in Psalms 44? Right. Okay. And Jesus responds to him in 39 and 40. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to the disciples, them being the disciples, why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? God's extravagance for us was his sacrifice of his son to save us that was so incredible but in the end as we've been talking about we have to have faith in the face of disappointment and that's ultimately what we need paul talked about logic and knowing it and but it's it's that faith and and it's great i amazing i i wanted to write down what byron said knowing god's love for us culminates in faith that's a neat way right. of bringing it together. It's knowledge of his love and ultimately his faith. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Elisa, can you tell us about In the Name of Jesus? I'm anxious to hear this one. Oh, yes, of, of course. Um, but before I do that, you know, one more point about what Mark was talking about. Ed, in um, Psalms 44, 26, the, the psalmist there ends his plea for God based on God's character. And he says, arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's mercy sake. sake. Yep. And that's very much like Daniel. When Daniel made that prayer, right? And, and, and Daniel was praying, you know, do this, Lord, because your people are called by your name. Yeah. And right. so by appealing to God's character, it demonstrated, I have no character within myself that I can make this appeal, but because of your character and who you are, I can appeal. Yeah. And so anyway... That kind of goes into Monday's lesson, talking about in the name of Jesus. In John 14, 14, Jesus said to his disciples, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So what does it mean to ask something in Jesus' name? And what does this promise mean for us living today? These are some of the questions that we're going to explore in Monday's lesson. Let's read together John 14, 1 to 14 to set the context. And the text reads, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also." And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. 
If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. When Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, he knew that he would be going away soon, back to heaven. And he wanted to encourage them and leave them with hope that he had not forsaken them and left them as orphans. That same power he had received from the Father, he was promising to them. This precious promise was given not only to his 12 disciples, but to all his people through the ages that would believe on him. We often close our prayers by saying, in the name of Jesus, because of this promise. What then does it mean that if we ask anything in Jesus' name, he will do it? Does that mean if we ask for any extravagance we may desire, he will give it to us? Or is there a deeper meaning here and a condition to this promise? Jesus gives us the context of this promise in John 14, in verse 10. He says, The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. In essence, Christ has submitted his life and mission on earth to the Father. He had come to the Father's, to do the Father's will, not his own. Therefore, anything asked of the Father was inspired by the Father. This is the model for how we are to live in Christ. Jesus goes on to make it plain in verses 15 to 18. And it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. The condition for God's true people is that, like Jesus, they will submit their will to the will of Christ and they will keep his commandments. And the Bible says that these commandments will not be grievous to them that love him. You can find that in 1 John 5, 3. And then going on in verse 16 and 17 of John 14, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus then promises the gift of the Holy Spirit who would guide and help his people that they may not stumble and would be able to walk upright in this evil world. Isaiah 30, 21 says, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Um, going back to John 14 in verse 18, it says, I will not leave you as orphans. I come to you. Even though Jesus is not physically with us, nor can be seen by us, he has promised that he will be with us now and will come for us again. In verses 23 of John 14, Jesus summarizes promise by saying, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. What a tremendous promise. Even though God is physically invisible to us, we can trust that he is with us that the Son and the Father love us and are vested in our salvation. The lesson points out that when our request is in the name of Jesus, we can be certain that the whole machinery of heaven is at work on our behalf. We may not see the angels working all around us, but they are sent from the throne of heaven in the name of Jesus to fulfill our requests. And uh, quoting from Ellen White in Prophets and Kings, she says, Speaking of the times when we are facing our darkest days and are tempted to lose all hope, she writes, Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences? We should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills, and new faith, new life would spring into them. Let's go on to Tuesday then and talk about the power of the resurrection. Thank you. And actually, that's one thing I loved about the verse you read. Is what you're praying for glorifying God? Yeah. 
כן. Because if it's not, then it's kind of a dead ringer. It's not in the name of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So, excellent. So, Tuesday, the power of the resurrection. So, let's start off um, three days before the resurrection of Christ. In John 19.30, um, Jesus says, therefore, um, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And this is what most people look to, the cross, right? Mm -hmm. Most people look to the cross, but without a resurrection, the cross doesn't mean that much. <laughs> so, and that was Friday at 3 p.m. On Saturday, it was Sabbath. Christ rested in the grave. On Sunday, he was resurrected. So what happened next? We look at John 20, 17. This is when Mary meets him near the tomb. And Jesus says to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. So I love the SDA Bible commentary on this, because why, what was Jesus doing ascending to the Father then? The point of objection is not that there is anything wrong or sinful in the physical contact with the risen body, with risen Christ. There is rather an urgency of situation. Jesus does not wish to be detained now to receive, Mary the, or to receive the homage of Mary. He desires first to ascend to his Father, there to receive the assurance that his sacrifice has been accepted. And that's also in Desire of Ages, page 790. After his temporary ascension, Jesus permitted, without protest, the act he now asked Mary to postpone. And we see that in Matthew 28, 9. So how big was the death and resurrection of Jesus? We could spend this entire lesson on it if we really wanted to. Romans 6, 4 says that therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So we have that symbolism there. We have 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, where we see how Christ will raise the dead to a glorified eternal body. And in verse 13, I love it, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Because the rest of the world has no hope in a resurrection. So Christ was resurrected to show those who fall asleep in him or that remnant church at the end, what will be your fate as well. And it's a good fate to have. Um, he gives us that hope and faith of the resurrection. Otherwise, what is the point of even being Christian? If there's no resurrection, you're, even Paul says we're men to be pitied. So, so let me ask you, if you had to endure hardships during this life, knowing what awaited you in the next, would you do it? We jump through hoops. I jump through hoops all day long for my job, for my wife, for your family, or whatever it may be. Sometimes, especially for ourselves. I don't know any of those people, but, so, but we do it all the time. But for God, we're kind of skittish at times, perhaps. But Jesus has given us the insur assurance that if we die in him, we shall be raised in him. He wants us in this life and the next. Do you think Jesus died and rose again so that we could be miserable? He wants us to have the joy and peace that transcends all understanding. That's better than anything this world has to offer. Forty days later, Jesus ascends to heaven permanently this time. Let us pick up the lesson scripture here. We're going to read Ephesians 1, 18 through 23. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. 
which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So let me ask you, did Jesus get any more power than before? Did he suddenly get supercharged? No. Then how do you explain like verses 21 through 23? He, Jesus conquered death at the cross. But whom else did he conquer? Satan. Through the cross, Jesus led a sinless life. He offered himself as a sacrifice to cover all sin, every last one, whether you repent or not, and showed the true character of Satan to the entire universe and the true character of God as well. Jesus won the war and the great controversy. The conflict between Christ and Satan and really the resurrection was the cross was the beginning. The resurrection was the culmination of that. And we see that battle played out. And we know Christ won. We can never forget that. Christ won the war. And although he has won the war, are there still battles raging? Every day. And we never even see some of them. The only thing... The war is won, but the battles carry on. And at this point in time, it's all about casualties. How many will be saved or how many will be lost? I just want to remind you, though, remember, always remember, Jesus already won. There is no the devil might win. It's already done, and there's no he will. It's not a maybe, probably, or I'm pretty sure. He will take us to heaven when he comes again. The remaining remnant and those that have fallen asleep in him. So in this battle that we're in daily, we have access to a power of the resurrected Christ, a power that conquered death, that conquered the devil, a power that being our high, high priest in heaven and interceding for us. The power that Christ is petitioning to the, uh, the Father for us. The power that guides the Holy Spirit in everyone's life here on earth. From the Son testified about the Father and the Holy Spirit testifies about the Son. This is the power we have access to. But it won't come if we don't ask. If you're looking to use that power in some way, as we discussed earlier, that's not in the name of Jesus, forget about it. You're going to be helpless and at the mercy of the devil. If you're seeking anything but the will of God, it's never going to happen. But if we access that power, we have the most powerful tool in the universe. If he rebukes the devil, the devil will flee. If we use his word, if we know his word, the devil will flee and it will teach us to stand firm in Christ daily. I hope we all do that. Mark, we're looking, we're looking at Wednesday to carry all of our worries. Amen. I mean, that gets pretty heavy, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, I mean, we just heard Byron talk about the power of resurrection in Ephesians, some powerful verses right in Ephesians there it talks about it. In fact, if you look at the word, and the question I want to ask is, why do you worry? Why does any of us worry with this great, huge power out there? If you read the, the Lord's Prayer, it starts this way, and I wanted to dig. This is similar to Ephesians. It says here in Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10, it says, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, by reading those two verses of, of the Lord's Prayer, as we read in Ephesians also, is that we acknowledge that one, in, in verse nine, that God is sacred and revered. Hallowed be his name. 
But not only that, we realize, we, we recognize that his will is, is done whenever he wants it. He is all powerful. Um, he can do, handle anything. And so, do you think he can handle our troubles and our worries? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Of course, right? And of course. And I think it's just, and what we're going to learn in Paul and, and Peter and David and Peter is how we do this. And so I wanted to dig into this in 1 Peter 5, verses 7. Um, we're going to read uh, his simple verse here. It says, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. There's no reason to worry um, right there. Peter also mentions that we're going to see troubles. And in fact, he, he goes on to this. He says, but we may, we can rely on God while it happens. And 1 Peter 5, chapter 5, verse 10, it says, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, established, strengthened, and settled you, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter says, it's not going to, and we, we realize we're going to have troubles, but we can always rely on the power of God to cast our care upon him. In fact, Peter borrowed this idea of casting. In fact, it's similar to fishing. You're, Byron, you're a fisherman, right? You're yeah. like fishing. Casting, what does it mean? It means throw it, away, throw it out there. Cast it to the Lord. Let the Lord handle it. He borrowed this idea actually from Psalms 55 verses, chapter 55 verses 22, where David describes, was going through some, talking about the whole Psalms, about how some friends that were turning against him. In Psalms chapter 55 verses 22, it also says this, it says, cast your burden to the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. By casting our fears to the Lord, the Lord Whatever his will is, is going to be done. He can handle these troubles that we have. It's not just Peter. It's not just David that tells us to rely on the power of the Lord. Also, Jesus did the same thing. In Matthew, I'm going to jump over to Matthew in chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Let's read what Jesus says. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body or what you'll put on. It is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds in the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, could add one cubit to his statue? I just want to stay there. How could we, you know, he is so powerful. How could we even change anything to him by worrying? So read in 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his day was not arrayed like these. Now if God so clothed, clothes the grass of the field, which is today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not cl much, will he not much more clothe you, O ye, o you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. It's a simple concept to give your worry to the Lord. How many of us fail every day? <laughs> Me. <laughs> in this idea. <laughs> I always, God, I'll take care of the little stuff. I save the big things for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the uh, reason our lesson, our lesson talks about it, and it reads right here, anxiety is caused by, you know, all sorts of things. It could be pressure at work, as, as you were talking about earlier, or unexpected criticisms, feeling that we're unwanted or loved, healthy or financial worries, feeling that we're not good enough for God or believing that we are not forgiven. Whatever the reasons, one reason we hang on to our pro one reason or hang on to our problems is we think we can sort them out ourselves better than anyone else can. But Peter urges us to reconsider this such idea. 
the reason we don't have to worry is that God cares. But God, but does God care enough to intervene with, when a divorce is looming or when we feel totally useless? The Bible says that he cares enough to transform any situation. And we've, and we've read a few of those today. God is all-powerful. We realize that we just need to cast our fears and doubts to him, and he'll take care of the rest. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, I actually love that, but that whole part is we never want to give him the little stuff. We're supposed to give him everything. Everything, everything. And I love this. My mother-in-law, whenever we used to drive or something, she would always pray before everything. I'm like, look to my wife. She prays an awful lot. She goes, in everything. I'm like, maybe there's a lesson to be learned there. Amen. So, Elisa, Thursday, yes. still mm -hmm. faithful when God cannot be seen. Yes. It's a great topic. Have you gone through dark times when it seemed like God just wasn't there? Maybe he had forgotten you or didn't care about you. Perhaps some of you are feeling that way today. Throughout history, God's people have experienced these trying times. The lesson on Thursday discusses the experience of the Judeans who were exiled in Babylon. Many may have been tempted to feel that God no longer cared about their situation. Perhaps they cried out, where are you, O Lord? We cannot see any evidence that you are still there or that you care about us. But God had not abandoned them. During these dark times, he spoke words of comfort and hope through the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah. In Isaiah 40, 11, he writes, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Let's read further about Isaiah's description of God in Isaiah 40, verses 27 to 31. And it reads, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In Jeremiah 25, God pronounces the fate of Babylon and all the wicked nations on earth. He also foretold the timeline for Babylon in verse 12. And it says, It shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it a perpetual desolation. Although the future may have looked bleak, to the Judean captives, God had not forgotten them, and he sent these words of comfort and hope of restoration. The book of Esther is another dramatic story of God's people in peril of being utterly destroyed because of the hatred of a wicked man and an irrevocable law. God intervenes to save them by using a faithful young woman, Queen Esther, to stand against the injustice, and speak on behalf of God's people to influence the king to make provision for their salvation. Again, the fate of the evil man who instigated the crisis was the very death he had been planning for the faithful Mordecai. This story and that of God's people exiled in Babylon are allegories for the experience of God's people at the end of time, when an evil power would again try to annihilate through an unjust law. In Revelation 13, 15, we read, speaking of the evil beast power and the crisis for God's true people, it says, 
He has granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. The Bible goes on to describe the end of that evil power and those who give their allegiance to that power in Revelation 14, 10, and 11. And it reads, He himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Revelation goes on to tell of the final outcome for God's faithful and patient saints whose character has been made pure by the blood of Christ and their faithfulness to the Lord. Revelation 21, 3 and 4 says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What a wonderful promise. Even though we may go through dark times during our sojourn here on earth, we can rest in the assurance that God is with us. He has not forsaken us, nor will he leave us as orphans. And in closing, Zechariah 2.8 reminds us of how precious we are to God and that he is always interested and involved in the lives of his people, even through their darkest days. And it reads, For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. So some final thoughts perhaps on this week's lesson. Um, Coming from Ellen G. White's writings and testimonies for the church, she says, Faith grows strong by coming in conflict with doubts and opposing influences. The experience gained in these trials is of more value than the most costly of jewels. Even so may it be, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. And I love that because even when we are in trials, we don't know the higher purpose. We might be in that trial just so we can help someone else down the road. Sure. Been there myself. Yep. yep. So, Mark, any final thoughts? Yeah, just a couple. I mean, you know, this lesson was packed full of awesome promises. And, you know, the ones I talked about and, and, and stuff, of course, was that no matter what happens, we will never be separated from the love of Jesus Christ, the love Amen. of God. And the other one that, that we have to remember is that we can cast our any of our worries to the Lord. I mean, the big things, as you were saying, and the little things. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I need to work on the little things. And those, those Bible promises help us ultimately with that, that ultimate idea that Jesus wants us to be able to see the invisible, to have faith that he is our supreme leader. You know, he is there for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I just want to read um, from Ellen White, Education, page 253 and 54. Faith is trusting God, believing that he loves us and knows best what is for our good. Thus, instead of our own, it leads us to choose his way. In place of our ignorance, it accepts his wisdom. In place of our weakness, his strength. In place of our sinfulness, his righteousness. Our lives, ourselves, are already His. Faith acknowledges His ownership and accepts its blessing. Truth, uprightness, purity have been pointed out as secrets to life's success. It is faith that puts us in possession of these principles. Every good impulse or aspiration is a gift of God. Faith receives from God the life that alone can produce true growth and efficiency. How to exercise faith should be made very plain. 
To every promise of God, there are conditions. If we are willing to do His will, all His strength is ours, and that would be that in Jesus' name. Whatever gift He promises is in the, or is in the promise itself. The seed is the Word of God, and that's from Luke 8, 11. As surely as the oak is from the acorn, so surely is the gift of God in His promise. If we receive the promise, we have the gift. Faith that enables us to receive God's gifts is itself a gift. Our faith is a gift of which some measure is imparted to every human being. So you can never say you don't have it. It grows as exercised in appropriating the word of God. In order to strengthen faith, we must often bring it in contact with the word. So if our word, faith is to grow, the word of God is essential in this. So I have to ask you, do you trust God? You say, yes, I trust God. Mm -hmm. Do you trust in his word? Do you trust it like the sun will come up tomorrow? And even then some. Do you know his promises? Are you spending time in his word to claim those promises? Like he'll never leave you or things like that. Mm -hmm. Are you calling in the name of Jesus and asking in his will that the might of the resurrected Savior will be there to aid you in all of your crucibles and temptations. Faith is the door to our eternal home. But to open it, we need to look at the world through the eyes of Jesus, not our own. I see the here and now almost like, or almost like I have blinders on. I only see a small bit. Jesus sees the visible and the invisible. He sees what we will never realize on this earth, and he knows what's best for me and what's best for you. Won't you trust him and let him be your sole guide in this world and in the next forever, and by faith grab hold of him and never let go? Let us pray. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we really have nothing good in ourselves as we just read and Lord we don't even know what we should do or where we should go unless you guide us so Lord we pray and ask for guidance from the Holy Spirit that you bring us to where you want us to be Lord that we might travel in the direction of your will that we might do your good pleasure on this earth and Lord that we might have a faith in you as sure as they said the sun rises as sure as gravity works as sure as we know things on this earth as a fact that we have that factual faith in you we know that you will resurrect us someday we know that you will never leave us we know Lord that you want the best for us in this world and Lord we know that we have an enemy that is powerful but compared to to the risen Savior he's nothing teach us to hold fast and abide in you Lord to spend time in your word and to allow our minds to be reformed into the image that you want that we may be transformed by beholding and Lord that we might see it now in this world and that we might spend all eternity looking at not only how you've changed us, but all that you've done for us and praise and glorify your name. We thank you, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.